Our brain is a true miracle. It allows us to receive, process, and respond to countless signals from our environments through our eyes, ears, skin, nose, and mouth. But how do we make use of this miracle when it comes to learning and instruction? John Sweller, creator of Cognitive Load Theory, believes that learning happens best under conditions that are aligned with human cognitive architecture. Welcome to this microlearning series called How Learning Happens. My name is Nidhi Sachdeva and I'm the developer and narrator of this micro lesson. Today, we're going to talk about cognitive load and problem solving. Let's get started. According to Kirshner and Hendrick, problem solving is possibly the hottest topic in education at the moment. It forms the basis of a number of constructivist approaches to teaching and learning. Also, it is one of the most highly regarded components of what has come to be known as 21st century skills. But how do we solve problems and continue to learn? John Sweller's cognitive load theory developed in the late 80s might help us answer that. Our brain has two major memory systems, working memory and long-term memory. We use our working memory when dealing with new information, such as solving a problem. Our long-term memory, on the other hand, is where acquired knowledge and information is stored for longer periods of time, sometimes indefinitely. Let us consider two important terms here, cognitive load and cognitive limit. Cognitive load is the amount of information a human is trying to process in working memory at any one time. It's basically how hard you're thinking. And cognitive limit is the maximum number of chunks a person can process in working memory at any one time. And this limit happens to be extremely limited. To better understand the cognitive limit of the working memory, we're now going to do a quick cognitive limit exercise. You're going to see a series of letters on the screen for about three seconds. Look at them and try to memorize them without writing them down. Here goes. Now write down the letters as they appeared on the screen. Let's do that again. Write down this new sequence. Which sequence was easier to memorize? I'm guessing number two. But why is that? They're actually exactly the same letters all the way through. Let's have a look. The second sequence is easier to memorize because it is arranged in chunks that make sense to our working memory. And hence, instead of memorizing 12 letters presented in the first sequence, our working memory is having to process only about four chunks or elements. As educators and learners, it is important for us to know about this cognitive limit of our working memory. This limited capacity forces us to arrange information in codes or chunks, also known as schemas. This is how we keep the cognitive load low on our working memory, which in turn allows us to store information in our long-term memory. If we didn't do that, no long-term learning could actually take place. And why is it important to store information in our long-term memory? Because that is how we build our domain-specific knowledge, which in turn helps us solve problems effectively. That is the key difference between how experts solve a problem and how novices solve a problem. Experts begin solving a problem by choosing a strategy that they are familiar with and then they work towards solving the problem, while novices use means-ends analysis. This means that they look for moves or steps that one can possibly carry out to solve the problem. This process can be often frustrating. Not only does this approach increase the load on our working memory, it even makes it unavailable to contribute towards long-term learning and hence accumulation of domain-specific knowledge. In other words, learners are not able to build their schemas or codes for future problem solving. In 1946, De Groot demonstrated this problem-solving approach 
by studying difference between chess masters and less experienced players. De Groot found that the Grand Masters didn't have a superior working memory, nor were they more creative or better at problem solving, but rather they remembered more meaningful chess positions. They were able to tap into their domain-specific problem knowledge stored in their long-term memory, which less experienced players did not possess. If you want your students to learn to solve problems, they first need both the declarative and procedural knowledge within the subject area of the problem in question. This is also true if you want to teach them how to communicate, how to write, or conduct meaningful discussions. For example, you can't communicate about something, write about something, discuss or argue about something without first knowing about that something and then also knowing the rules that is, the procedures for doing that. So how can we apply this approach in our teaching practice as educators? First of all, we want to avoid backwards problem solving, which is the means ends analysis. Instead, we want to focus on creating situations where learners can work forwards. We want to provide them with the prerequisite knowledge and expose them to multiple situations where they would utilize domain-specific knowledge to solve a problem themselves. The idea is to decrease the cognitive load on the learners. Remember, too much cognitive load hinders learning. We want to do just the opposite. 